All right, welcome to lab five. It's our second lab on ANOVA. Last time we, um, we basically didn't get through in class all of lab four. We were just about to start talking about simulating the F distribution. Uh, we'd done all these other things. And so for example, just to remind, uh, we were looking at a textbook example of some data where we had 20 subjects five subjects were in um, in each group there was four different groups and we saw how we could use the AOV function to compute an ANOVA table and arrive at a F value and um, that represents a ratio of how much variation there was between the means and how much variation there was within each group and this ratio, uh, here we see there's seven times more variation between the groups than within the groups. Uh, the ANOVA function gives a p-value here. This is the probability of getting a value of 7.227 or larger. Now, all of this stuff here, the degrees of freedom, sums of squares, mean squared errors, and the f-value, uh, come from the data. These are summary statistics, right? We estimate the sum of squares from the data. We divide them by the degrees of freedom to get the mean squared errors, which are variances. And then this seven, that's 16.98 in the numerator divided by 2.35. So all of this stuff is just comes from the data. We, uh, last time we, we didn't get to the concept of this p-value. Uh, one thing that I think is sometimes confusing is where does this p-value come from? We see that the f-value is computed from the data. Well, where does the distribution of f-values come from that let, that gives us this p-value? So this is something I hope to clarify in today's lab. Our general question is, how can you know if your experiment works? We'll be thinking about specific designs with one independent variable and multiple levels, more than two levels. So this is an extension from last semester where we were only considering designs with two levels, say a control group where nothing happens and uh, an experimental group where you do a manipulation. You might wanna know if there's a difference in your measurement caused by the manipulation. Well, you can have more than two groups if you want. You could have, say, a control experiment, a control group where nothing happens, and then several groups where more and more of something happens, or uh, a bunch of different things happen. All of those could be examples of having an independent variable that you manipulate across many different groups. You might be interested to determine whether your manipulation causally changes something about what you're measuring. It could change lots of different things. It could change the means in the groups. It could change the variances. The ANOVA is set up to help you examine possible changes in means that are not due to chance. We're gonna be talking about experiments where different people are assigned to different groups. And so we recognize that this random assignment process can introduce variability. The groups will be different because we've put different people in them. And so uh, we have, we, we know right away that one reason uh, the means could be different in the different groups is that we had different people in them. And, and that wouldn't be really great evidence that our manipulation caused the difference. So we're interested in coming up with methods to sort of sort out, you know, what, what differences are likely caused by the manipulation and what differences are caused by the random assignment process or the existing variation in the measurement. So what we wanna do is um, think about 
the kinds of differences we could have found in the long run. As we just mentioned, the F value is something you can compute from your data that gives you a number that um, show that gets larger as when the variance between groups is a bigger amount than the variance within your groups. Uh, a moment ago, I asked the question, where does the F distribution come from? I want to point out that in R, just like the other, uh, just like for other distributions, there is this thing called an F distribution. You can look it up in help. So I'll just type RF, that's the name of a function where you could sample random numbers from an F distribution. Uh, there's also the quartile and the probability function, the density function. So just like the other uh, normal normal distribution function and things like that, um, there's a family of functions for the F distribution. The design we were thinking of from lab four had 20 subjects in four groups. The uh, F value, or sorry, the degrees of freedom there would be three in the numerator and 16 in the denominator. And if you say put those values into the RF function, we, we could sample a thousand values from an F distribution. So here's, here's those values sampled and we could make a histogram and we could see, okay, appar apparently the F distribution on these degrees of freedom looks like this. Okay, well, you might be wondering, well, what is this? F distribution that we're talking about. Uh, it's a good question. Um, let's head back here and start thinking about that. The F distribution for a null hypothesis is effectively um, a, a massive distribution of control experiments. What we're going to imagine here is that instead of running your experiment, you are simply going to sample different people into your different groups. Okay, you're going to measure them just as you normally would in your experiment. However, you're not going to do anything different to the people in your groups. Uh, there won't be a manipulation. So it'll, if you have four groups, you're just going to take your subjects, randomly assign them to the four different groups, and measure what you're going to measure in your experiment. But you won't manipulate anything. So this is a situation where you can obtain some data, you can still compute an F value, and you might wonder what kinds of F values you could get in these situations when you're not manipulating anything. You're just randomly assigning people to different groups. So if you were to do this like a thousand times, that is run a control experiment where you don't do anything a thousand times and every time you computed the F value, you'd essentially have a distribution of F values that would be like I'm what I call the ultimate set of control experiments. Um, you would be able to see exactly the kinds of values you would get uh, for F. And you would know that all of those values were due to chance because you didn't do a manipulation. So it was just due to random assignment. Now, that's what uh, this distribution here re refers to. It's a F distribution showing the kinds of F values you could get by chance for a design with four groups and five people per group or 20 total subjects. So let's see if we can uh, expose some of the assumptions behind this distribution by thinking about how we could make it ourselves in R through simulation. So the, the basic assumption here is that 
all of the scores for your different subjects are being randomly sampled from a normal distribution. And the other assumption is that they are sampled from the same normal distribution. So we can actually implement this idea in R not without too much trouble. We'll continue using some smaller numbers. Uh, so let's head over to R here. We'll have uh, four groups or levels in our experiment, and we'll have five people in each group, just like the Bransford and Johnson example. I'm going to make a little data frame here, and let's I'll make the data. Let's take a look at it. So here we have 20 different subjects. Um, the independent variable has four groups. And I've randomly sampled some numbers into the dependent variable column. I've specified right here um, that I'm sampling. Uh, so it's going to be levels, which is four times n per level, which is five. So that's I'm going to sample 20 numbers from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. All right. Now, on average, all the groups, you know, in the long run should basically be the same because they're all, uh, the scores in all of the groups are being sampled from the very same distribution. Nevertheless, we can conduct an ANOVA. So there I, I did that. I computed all of the ANOVA terms for this random data, and I'm extracting the F value from the ANOVA table. So um, let's just quickly look at that. So the ANOVA table um, is right here, and this particular set of random data had an F value of 0 0.073, okay? So that's a pretty small f value. If I was to redo this, um, rerun this line here, I'm going to resample the values in the dependent variable. So we could do it again and see for this ANOVA, uh, for, for actually for this set of random data, what do we get? An f value of 0.12. Fine, let's do it again. And what F value do we get? 1.1. These aren't impressively large, but we, we're seeing that we can randomly get uh, different F values in this situation for this design. Now, if we head back to lab four, where we're looking at some sample data, In this sample data, we got an F value of 7.227. And that seems unlikely according to this p-value. Well, how, how likely is it to get a F value this large just by random chance? If we continue doing this process I was doing by hand many times, so create random data sampled from a normal distribution, compute the F value, and do that many times. I've, I've got a, some code set up right here to do that. Let's do it a thousand times. So this is like running a thousand different control experiments where every time the, the values that you measure for 20 different subjects are just random numbers sampled from the very same normal distribution. Every time we save the F value. So I put them all in this variable here. So these are a thousand different F values from all the 1000 different simulations that we did. What does this look like? Well, this is a simulated distribution of F values that you would get from your control experiment. 
I'm going to put them into this data frame F comparison. And what I've done here is, first of all, I'm, um, I've taken a thousand random F values from the from the analytic distribution, the one we get using RF from R. And um, also the values that we just computed in our simulation. And I put them in this little data frame so that we can make a plot and just kind of look at these two distributions. So this is the analytic distribution that you would get using uh, the base R function. And here is our simulated F distribution. As you can see, they look pretty similar. Now, my point is that if you increased the number of simulations that you ran, uh, so we only did a thousand here, so this is an approximation. Um, as you increase the number of simulations, your simulated F distribution will approach the true uh, analytic one. So this distribution is just the kinds of F values you would get under the null assumption. And the null assumption is that all of the values in your experiment are being sampled from the very same normal distribution. So this kind of gets into some of the basic assumptions that are inherent to ANOVA. Um, here we go. And I've just said this a couple times, but the basic assumption is that all the numbers in your data are sampled randomly from the same normal distribution. I want to make a couple points here. If you remember last semester, we talked about normal distributions having the same shape. All of them have the same shape. They've got different means and you can have different means and standard deviations, uh, but the shape is the same. So what that means is um, the kind of F distribution that we get is always the same, no matter what the parameters are of the normal distribution. When we created this simulated uh, F distribution, we assumed that all of the data was coming from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Well, what if you were trying to guess what would happen in your experiment and you knew that your measurement wasn't coming from a normal di distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Maybe it's coming from a standardized test distribution where the mean is, let's say, 50 and the standard deviation is 25. I've implemented that here. I've just changed the parameters of the normal distribution in our modeling situation. So we're going to run an experiment where we have four levels, five people per group. All of the numbers are being randomly sampled from a distribution with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 25. So this is still a normal distribution. It just has different parameters. We're going to get a, run the experiment a thousand times. We're going to save the F value every time. And what I've done is just um, added another simulated F distribution here for this new scenario where the parameters of the normal distribution have changed. And as you can see, we get a fairly similar result again. So the parameters don't matter here. You get the same F distribution, no matter what the parameters of the normal are. A common term to describe this fundamental assumption that we're making in the ANOVA is uh, sometimes abbreviated as IID. This is the idea that all of the numbers are being sampled independently or randomly from all the other scores, and each score is sampled from the identical distribution as all the other scores. And we can see that we've implemented that assumption right here 
when we sample all of the values randomly from the same normal distribution. I'm just pointing out that it doesn't matter what the parameters of the normal distribution are. Okay, let's do another kind of fun thing. Let's uh, violate the assumptions of the ANOVA for a hot second. So we could easily do that. Um, all of these F distributions assume that the values are coming from a normal distribution, right? So what kinds of F values would you get if the data wasn't coming from a normal distribution? It's a question mark. A lot of times we assume that the data in real experiments are normally distributed because of the central limit theorem. So if you had an experiment with 20 people and five people in each group, for each person, you might be measuring, a f measuring them a couple times or more to get a mean for that person. And if all of the subject means, um, sorry, it, it, if all if you have multiple measures per subject and you take and you're looking at and you enter their means into an ANOVA, you can assume the subject means will be roughly normally distributed because of the central central limit theorem. Um, and as we've kind of just demonstrated here, you don't really need to care uh, what the actual parameters are of the normal distribution because you get the same null F distribution regardless of what the parameters are. So you just need to assume your subject means are coming from a normal, then you can uh, make use of the null F distribution. Well, what, what if we knew that was totally wrong? What I've done here is I've created a way to sample values from a bimodal distribution. So I just um, made an example here. If uh, so, sampled a few numbers um, with one mode being centered around zero and the other one being centered around five. So definitely not a normal distribution. Okay. What if we were to run an example here where all of the data is now sampled from a bimodal distribution um, rather than a normal distribution? So I've done that. Um, we have, again, four groups, five people per group, and I'm just randomly sampling numbers from this bimodal distribution across all of the groups. So we violated the ANOVA assumption that the data is coming from a normal distribution. However, we're keeping the assumption that the data is coming independently from an identical distribution. It's just not a normal distribution. It's a bimodal one. So we can still compute our F values every time we do this. And I did that. And let's plot them. So now we have the true F distribution. Our simulations based on sampling from a normal distribution. And then another distribution of F values where we violated the normality assumption and our values are coming from a bimodal distribution. It's quite interesting that we're basically seeing the same F distributions everywhere. So this is a way of showing that the, the F statistic is actually fairly robust uh, to these violations of the ANOVA assumptions. Now, let's return to one of the questions we had earlier which has to do with interpreting these uh, F distributions. And I've got to fix this here so the p-value gets a nice header. Now, before we do that, let's just quickly, oops, I meant to go back to the course website. Here we go. Right, 
This is from lab four. We're going back to that Bransford and Johnson example. So here, we know we found that there was an F value associated with a 0 0.002 probability of getting this value or larger. And um, I guess we could head back over to lab five and ask, first of all, you know, because we've got the same design here, we've got the same degrees of freedom. We could say, well, yeah, what's the probability of getting a 7.22 for any of these F distributions, uh, especially the ones we are obtained through simulation? And my point would be if you look for the probability of getting 7.22, uh, you should get roughly the same probability because these are all pretty much the same F distribution. Another way we can look at that is to think about, say, critical values of F. So for this design with four groups and five people per group, um, what's the point here where 95% of the F values would be smaller than this critical value of F, somewhere around here-ish? Um, we can compute the exact critical F value using the QF function. So here I put in 0.95, I entered the degrees of freedom for this design, and it's telling us that analytic true value is 3.23. Okay, great. Well, um, we just made four different kinds of F distributions. I'm calling this one the analytic one, but remember we just sampled 1000 random values from the true F distribution. So the probability, um, so this is a little noisy version of the analytic distribution. And then we've got uh, two simulations, assuming the scores came from the normal and one from a bimodal. And we might wanna know Okay, well, where's the critical value of F in these distributions? Each of these distributions has a thousand numbers in it. So what we could do is just take the values and I can flip over to R here. So we have this. And I just wanna make sure needed to make sure I'd run all the lines of code appropriately. So let's take a look at our F comparison. Uh, this is a data frame here. It's got a lot of data in it. It's got the thousand values that I sampled from the RF function, and it's got a, a thousand values for every simulation. So what I wanna do is just say, let's take a look at the random values from the analytic distribution. And if I use this kind of indexing, this will identify only those 1000 values for the, uh, the ones that where the type is, says the word analytic. So these first 1000, and I'm selecting the F value column. So this is just a way of getting the 1000 Fs I'm interested in. And remember, these are just in a completely random order. So if I sort them, then they'll go from smallest to largest. So the, the ones at the beginning would be closest to zero, and then the ones at the end are the largest ones that were in there. So there's only a thousand of them. So I wanna know what value of F do I get um, in the 950th position, that'd be the 95% the point. And I can see that, oh yeah, that value is 3.18. Pretty close to 3.23, pretty close to the same critical value. We're off by a fudge factor. Well, how about our simulated F distributions? We could ask the same question. Uh, this time we got 3.44. For this one, for this one, we get uh, 2.97. For this one, we get 3.73. Uh, 
Um, every time we do these simulations, we'll get slightly different values. Um, you can see here, this represents uh, a different run. And we're getting numbers that are all kind of close to 3.23. They're a little off. If we increased our simulations um, from 1,000 to 10,000, we'd probably do a, a little bit better. But my point is not that they're identical. Um, these, these three should eventually be the same value once you increase the number of simulations. I'm not so sure that this one would be exactly the same. It's going to be pretty close. But um, yeah, so the basic purpose of talking about all of this is to give you a, a better sense of where the F distribution is coming from. It's just a hypothesis that uh, all of the data in your experiment has been randomly sampled from one distribution with no differences between the groups. The only differences between the groups are produced by the random assignment of the data to the groups. And if you were to do that and compute F, you'd expect some variation in F and these distributions just show you the variation you'd expect to get by chance. Um, so I like to think of these as chance windows. For example, let's look at the range. We've got 0 to 15. So it looks like, oh boy, yeah, you got a 15 and a couple, maybe one time in this distribution. So by chance alone, you can get I mean, most of the time you're getting F values between say like zero and three, it looks like. Most of the time, in all of these distributions, you're not getting values much higher than five. Hardly ever, just very, very infrequently. Certainly, you're not getting values of 40. You know, look at that. This, there's no 40, it's way off the scale. So this is really giving you a sense of what the random assignment process can produce. It can produce differences kind of like this. And sometimes it produces some big differences, but not very often. Okay, we've also seen that the actual F distributions that you, you get are seemingly robust to uh, violations of the assumption of the ANOVA. So you could get an F distribution based on sampling numbers from a bimodal distribution that's pretty similar to these other ones. All right, I think I'm gonna split the videos up into two sections, but I'll do one more before I head over to discussing the alternative hypotheses. We've been talking a lot about constructing a null hypothesis. Um, and before we head to the alternative hypothesis, I wanted to bring up the randomization test. So, uh, we can still do something like the ANOVA without making any of the assumptions of the ANOVA. So for example, um, I, I came up with this silly example here. Imagine if you had an experiment with three groups and you take all the tall people in the room and you put them in one group. And then you take the people of average height and you put them in a, a group and take all the shorter per people and you put them in another group. Now, if you gave each group different kinds of music to listen to, that's your manipulation. Um, would you then conclude that you caused the different people to have different heights? I mean, it'd be pretty obvious that the reason there's um, different heights, different average heights in the different groups is because of how you assigned them to those groups. So uh, we know that assigning different people to different groups can produce group differences. In a randomization test, what you're interested in determining is what are the chances or what kinds of differences between groups could you have got just by your process of randomly assigning people to different groups? It's kind of like asking, if you're going to take a bunch of people of different heights, what are the chances you'd accidentally put all the tall people in one group and all the short people in another group? Um, you could do it by chance, but what are the chances? So we can assess this um, without the F distribution from the ANOVA. We can create our own F distribution based on the randomization test. I've created some example data 
again, we'll have four groups and we'll have five people per group. And this is kind of like the, the height example. I totally made up these numbers. So I want to be very clear that I violated the assumption of the ANOVA because none of these numbers came from a null distribution, from a normal distribution. They all came from me randomly putting whatever numbers I wanted in here. This set refers to the numbers that I chose for group one. And this is the numbers I chose for group two, three, and four. This sort of represents the idea that, you know, pretty much everyone in groups two, three, and four are uh, around nine, right? And it just happens to be the case that everyone in group one is above 10, 11, 12, 11, 11, 12. Okay, so it's sort of like taking, like what are the chances that all the people with um, some of the larger scores would happen to go in group one um, and everyone else wouldn't? Because if you got data like this, you might think, oh, well, the thing I did in group one totally caused a change here. Look at that. But you, on the other hand, you might think, what are the chances I accidentally just put those people in that group? Okay, well, we can compute an F value based off of this data. Here it is. It happens to be 7.407 for these numbers. And this probability, though, you know, that's associated with the assumptions of the normal distribution, that you get an F value this larger, larger, this often if you were randomly sampling numbers from a normal distribution into this design. But that's not what I did, right? These numbers aren't normally distributed. So we could say, because we violated the assumption of the ANOVA, this p-value is irrelevant to this F value. What we want to know is what kinds of F values could we got, uh, could we have received um, if uh, we imagined how we could have assigned these numbers differently. Like this is just one way that these specific numbers could be assigned to these groups. And we could certainly reshuffle the numbers, just completely randomize the order or permute the sequence and we'd have a different ordering and we could calculate the F value for that ordering. And we could do that lots of times, compute the F value every time and we could see a distribution of F values you could get uh, if you just randomly reordered the data. So I did that here. And uh, it looks exactly like these two pieces of code where I define the data frame, conduct the ANOVA. The only thing I'm gonna add is right here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna declare the, the data in the exact same order as before, but I'll just put it inside the sample function. So that means that every time we do this, um, oh, this looks a little weird. Every time we do this, the data will be reshuffled. So let's kind of do it here. So there's our data, here's our ANOVA. So we got a value of 7.4 for that data. Uh, this part's a little weird. I'm just going to delete that. Tab this over. And if we were to look at the data frame, we can see that 11, 12, 11, 11, 12, those are the numbers that have been assigned to group one and all the numbers around nine have been assigned to the other groups. Uh, every time I run this piece in here, let's see what happens. Now the numbers have just been all this, the subjects and the IV part is the same, but the dependent variable is completely shuffled. So the numbers are just being assigned to different groups. And of course I can recompute the F value. So what I'm gonna do here is just do this a thousand times, every time reshuffling these numbers, computing a new F value. Now, here's what we can do. I'm plotting the F distribution that um, from the ANOVA or where you would assume that the numbers came from a normal distribution. And now I'm plotting the F distribution I got from randomly just taking the existing numbers and 
randomly reshuffling them. I noticed that these two distributions are actually pretty similar. Um, in fact, if you, in this case, let's see, what is the probability of getting a 7.407 or larger? Uh, according to the randomization test, that's 0 0.003. So you're getting a value that's pretty similar to the one you'd get from the ANOVA. All right, the next video will be on thinking about simulating alternative hypotheses in the ANOVA.